In 2007, Paul O'Neill, or Jim O'Neill, was flying from Glasgow, Scotland to Colchester, England. And on his way, suddenly, his vision fails. He thought, well, maybe I'm just blinded by the sun. But after a while, he realized it was much worse. He had suffered a stroke. This gives new meaning to the phrase, flying blind. Luckily, O'Neill had installed a, an autopilot avionics in his plane a couple of years ago, so he knew for the moment he was okay, but autopilot doesn't land a plane. So he keyed his mic on his yoke and called Manchester Control and issued a mayday to them. Paul Gerard of the RAF quickly scrambled and caught up to O'Neill who was still on course to Colchester, England. He started talking to the blinded pilot and said, look, we're going to land this plane. You're near Manchester airfield. I'm right behind you, about a 500 feet away. Trust me, you can do this. Turn the autopilot off. I'll give you your numbers and you can imagine it in your mind as if you're flying there inside your mind. I'll read you out your numbers. Just trust me, you can do this. Now, ease the yoke forward and begin your descent. Keep going. Now, turn to the right. Keep going. Now a little left to stop your roll. Keep easing the yoke forward, descending. You're heading at 270 at 4,400 feet. O'Neill was learning what it's like to fly blind. Today we begin a journey to the cross and to the empty tomb. Using the book of Job as our guide, Job is a powerful book about trust in God when life seems to be falling apart around us, when things are just going haywire and nothing seems to make sense. Job had it all. He had wealth. He had fame. He had family and friends. And then Satan came tempting, and it was gone. Wife and family dead, wealth lost, friends scattered. It got so bad that even Job's house was blown away so that he was living on an ash heap at the edge of town. How did this happen? How did he go from everything to nothing? How did Jesus go from everything, the Son of God, to nothing crucified on a tree. We all know what it's like to be struck. Maybe not with a stroke, but with divorce papers or a crippling expense, a sudden illness, a cancer-ridden body. Not mid-air, but mid-marriage, mid-life mid-semester or mid-career. Our lives are thrown into turmoil and losing sight of any safe landing place, we throw up our own mayday prayers. We know what it's like to fly blind. And so does Job. One of the Bible's greatest wisdom books is the book of Job. In this Lenten season, through nine sermons, we're going to dig in into the central theme of Job and its supporting truths. And through six uh, Bible studies, we're also going to look at the Job's major themes and uh, topics there. So to get the most out of this Lenten series, 
I would encourage you to attend a Bible class or find a small group because most of our small groups are going to follow this, these uh, lessons as well. That way you will appreciate what Job says to you because it is God's word after all. Tonight we begin at the beginning. It's a very good place to start, so saying Julie Andrews. Tonight we start with Job 1, 1 to 12. And what do we learn? We learn to fly blind. Now sometimes we know why bad things happen to us. If I'm traveling down the interstate at 90 miles an hour and the speed limit is 75 on the turnpike and I see lights flashing behind me, I know the cop is going to write me a ticket and I'm going to be out $275. Why? Because I'm a lead foot pastor. That's why. <laughs> if you get a paper that comes back with a 57% in red circled around it with an F on it, why did that happen? Well, probably because you didn't do your work before the test, listening in class, and you probably didn't study for your test. If you're traveling down the road in the car and all of a sudden it starts sputtering and dies, you wait, why did this happen? Well, because the gas gauge had below E and you totally ignored it. Sometimes we know why bad things happen. But then again, sometimes we don't. And so it was with Job. He didn't know why bad things were happening. Job's suffering in our text was undeserved. It was unjust. It was unwarranted. In verses 1 and verse 8 of our text today, it described Job as blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Now, Job wasn't sinless. No one is sinless except for Jesus. But Job was a godly man. He followed the will of God. He followed God's will so closely that even his friends and neighbors said that he was a righteous man. And in case we didn't catch it, in chapter 2, verse 3, it says it again, that Job was blameless and upright, a man who shuns evil who fears God and shuns evil. He was an innocent sufferer. He didn't deserve any of his human hell. But verse 6 kind of lifts the curtain and gives us a glimpse into invisible spiritual realities that most of the time, us humans are not privy of. It seems that Satan had come before God to make a wager with God. Satan comes before him. Satan, whose name means the accuser. Like a, um, a vindictive lawyer or a um, corrupt policeman, who's always trying to frame the innocent, Satan comes before God trying to trap someone and drag him before the judgment scene of God to condemn him. This is the reality that you and I as humans don't see. This is part of that conversation in heaven that we're not made aware of. So in verse 8, Job 1.8, the Lord says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? You know, that's like a jewel thief walking into a jewelry store and the owner says, Have you seen my most precious diamond? Let me show you this diamond that I have. It's the most valuable diamond that we have here. It's flawless in its cut and its clarity. Here, let me show it to you. It's like tempting a thief. Thank you, God. Satan then asks 
the Lord a question that is really a theme for this book. It's the key question of this book. Job 1 verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, Satan says that Job fears God because God has been good to Job. He says, Job follows you, yeah, because of all the blessings that you've been giving to him. He likes your blessings at least more than he does you, God. Take away all these blessings from Job, and I'll bet that Job will curse the giver and reject God. Satan bet the farm on this wager. And of all stunners, God takes that bet. He knows Job. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well, everything that he has is in your hands, but on the person himself, you may not lay a finger. Job was about to become ground zero for Satan's assaults. You and I here get to hear a conversation that most of the time humans don't hear. We've heard it, but Job doesn't know it. He has no clue what's happening behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. So when all hell breaks loose in Job's life, he cries out, Where are you, God? Job was forced to learn how to fly blind. And so do we. When trouble and turmoil and seem like negative things keep happening in our lives, we're forced to fly blind as well. We don't know what's happening in the spiritual realm, what's going on, the conversations taking place there. That's what suffering does for us. It makes us cry out, God, where are you? The fortunate thing is, is that we're going to the right person with our complaints, with our prayers, because God is the only one who can do anything about it. We can't, Satan won't, only God can. God is the only all-powerful one. And what we know also from Job is that God is in on those spiritual conversations that we don't know about. Maybe God is placing a wager on you as well. Maybe he knows that you can deal with this hardship that's coming in your life. Maybe, maybe he knows that you will trust him even more when you're flying blind, as scary and as difficult as that may be. But think about this. You're not the first to fly blind, and you won't be the last. Is there another one person in Scripture that we're told about as flying blind where we're given insights into the spiritual conversations that most humans don't get? Yes, there is. It all leads to Jesus. It all leads to Jesus. Our gospel lesson, Luke 4.13. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. We get another bird's eye glimpse of spiritual realities. Jesus, like Job, was blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Only Jesus was sinless in the fullest and most complete way imaginable. Jesus was the ultimate innocent sufferer. Like no other, 
Jesus did not earn or deserve any of this human hell. With Job, God didn't allow Satan to tempt him to the point of death. With Jesus, however, God allowed him to marshal all his weapons of mass destruction. If Job was reduced to living on an ash heap at the edge of town, Jesus was stripped naked and nailed like a scarecrow to a wooden stake and posted in that God-forsaken garbage dump called Golgotha. When you and I cry out from the depths of our suffering, where are you, God? Remember, Jesus cried the same thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you cry out from the depth of your suffering, remember, Jesus has experienced the same thing. Jesus says, I am here on the cross suffering with you and suffering for you. I'm here bleeding for the sins of the world. I'm here feeling your pain. I'll always be here for you as together we long for that new Jerusalem where I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. In that place and at that time, there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more pain, no more crying, for the old things have passed away. And if we want to hear how unbelievable suffering like Job's can be transformed into infinite goodness, then we journey from the cross to the open grave where our victorious conqueror stands before us with his hands outstretched, granting us the gift of life. It is there that we find the strength and courage to say once again, I know that my Redeemer lives. And on that day, in my flesh, I will stand before God. Well, on that day in 2007, on his first attempt, Jim O'Neill hit the tarmac and bounced up again. That's what they call ground effect lift. But Paul Gerard kept a calm voice and provided, spoke to him words of assurance and hope. On the eighth try, Paul o or Jim O'Neill landed his plane on the tarmac in a near perfect landing. When we're flying bind, there are many competing voices that come to us, many well-meaning friends. When we're flying blind, we hear all kinds of advice. The talk show host who says not to worry. The financial advisor who says buy now. Our friends who say read this book. And then we add to that our own voices that ask, what's the use? And in the end, quite often, we crash and burn. We need to return once again to listen to the voice, the only voice that matters. Jesus speaks tenderness and love. Ease the yoke forward. A gentle turn to the right. A little left rudder. 20 feet, 10 feet, 3, 2, 1, touchdown. 
at this table, Jesus speaks to us words for the ages. Take, eat. This is my body. Take, drink. This is my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. In listening to those guiding words, we know we will land safely in the loving arms of our Savior today and forevermore. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.